back today with an old friend, another old friend by the name of Ken Bird, um, something of a celebrated uh, former policeman, um, and really great to have you here, Ken. Um, you know, as this these talks have evolved, I've um, realized we want to try and bring in as many different people from the different services. And also, you know, I'd, I'd like to get more about the former enemy um, combatants involved in telling their story. But, you know, um, it's just to try and give the, uh, the whole story as broad a canvas as possible. And the BSAP, um, arguably one of the greatest police forces in history, in, in my view, um, and you were a, a very prominent member of that. And the BSAP played such a huge role in the whole uh, conflict as it unfolded and in various forms. Um, and you seem to have covered a lot of those bases in your career. So you're particularly well placed to talk about um, how the BSAP and how the police uh, fitted into the, in, into the whole war situation. Um, and yeah, salute to great men and women of all races who served in that uh, fine force. Uh, you know, I still uh, have people somewhat fascinated when I tell them that uh, throughout the war, and it, and, it was a, and it was a very widespread civil war, the men of the BSAP um, still were unarmed for most of the, of the war, uh, apart from the chaps that were out in the field. Obviously they were armed, but, but, the, but the policemen in the, in, in the cities and town remained unarmed throughout that war, which I find um, quite an amazing achieve, achievement, but it was a testament to the caliber of men and women that, that served with you. So um, without me banging on anymore, I just want uh, to ask you to just tell us a little bit about where you came from and your your story uh, in the BS in the BSAP. Thanks for being here, Ken. Thanks, Alice. Well, I was born in Matabeleland, um, where my father had a a farm in the Bembezi area, but um, he was also a mechanical engineer, so he wore the two hats. But he was pulled more towards the uh, mechanical engineering, um, which he was very keen on me going into civil engineering, but I couldn't make up my mind. So eventually he said, well, go to the BSAP, do three years and see how you feel after that. So my first station was uh, Karoi, and on my arrival there, it was basically in the middle of um, incursions from Zambia. So it was a pivotal point for the operations in, at that time. And being such a young patrol officer, I was thrown right into the midst of it. Um, police work went out the window and I was purely on uh, anti-terrorist work. And we covered such a huge area from Karoi right down to the Zambezi Valley, um, halfway across to Gokwe. In fact, it was probably about 15,000 square kilometers that we were on. Anyway, my first major operation on that was, um, it was just after midnight on the 15th of March in 1968, uh, when four of us uh, set off for um, an area called the Chawori Wilderness, where we had to meet up with a game department guy who had discovered some strange uh, footprints in an area that should have been devoid of humans. Um, so we met up with him, in fact, we uh, were uh, couriered by helicopters and um, we met up with him and uh, he indicated the, the tracks to us which we identified as uh, as Russian issue uh, boot spore that was issued to the uh, the Zaku terrorists in those days. Once we confirmed that, that kicked off um, the famous operation, Operation Cauldron. Um, we were then uh, reinforced by uh, three commander RLI uh, under Bert Sachs, Lieutenant Bert Sachs, and we commenced the follow-up on the um, on the terrorist tracks. 
I suppose we'd followed about <clears throat> up to 40 of these, uh, these fellows um, through rivers that were, we had a small amount of water in them and things like that. But, we, you know, we were such amateurs. We'd had no training. Um, in fact, we'd just uh, gone off the old 303 rifles onto the FN rifles. And so I think it was probably at the military request that we get pulled out because we were probably more of a danger to them than we were to the terrorists. And uh, we were pulled out um, of the tracks and we based up on a river bank. And we saw them pass us the next morning in the, um, the Angle River. And they made contact with this big group um, a little after sun, probably about 10 o'clock in the morning. But that was my first introduction to actually being close to a, a contact. We weren't even in the contact ourselves, but you know we could hear this whole lot going on. And eventually we had to go down and do a, a sweep through. The danger was all over. But what astounded me was the damage to the casualties. There was about 17 dead terrorists in there. And it took me years to work out how these guys had suffered such damage, where limbs had been ripped off and heads were shredded, brains were missing and things like that. And then I found out that there was a lot of close quarter contact there with uh, automatic shotguns being used against them. And because of their uh, rocky defensive position, there was a lot of ricocheting from the 7.62 ball ammunition, which was tumbling and taking arms off at the shoulders and things like that. So anyway, that uh, that whole thing didn't put me off too much um, because we continued on with incursions and um, within the sort of uh, counter-operational insurgency. Um, and so I preferred that to actually doing any police work. And I went off to the uh, Black Boots support unit. So it was... Uh, Support unit used to do rotations around the country uh, into the high risk um, incursion areas. And on one such um, deployment up into the um, Victoria Falls Wanky area, <clears throat> we had to do a follow up of a newly in, in, uh, invading group. But we lost all information on these guys once they disappeared into the tribal areas. We had no idea where they were. Everybody was working blind. There was just no intelligence. And so I uh, decided to set a trap. Um, and we walked for miles one night under a full moon. In fact, it was raining like hell. And we walked um, under this full moon, breaking through this cloud cover. And after hours and hours, we arrived at a, a hamlet, shortly before first light. But we had remained uncompromised. No one knew we were there. And we observed this, this uh, hamlet from a fairly reasonable high ground. And we waited to see if any unwelcome guests arrived, any of the, uh, the terrorists arrived. Um, nothing happened that day. And the night passed uh, in miserable, rainy weather. We had enough of it. And I decided, well, we were going to uh, carry out a trap on these guys. And we sent the dirtiest trooper in there. And he approached the village... Uh, Crawlhead, and he said uh, he was part of the uh, group that had come in from Zambia. They had shot up the uh, Victoria Falls uh, airport tower, and he'd become separated from this group. Could they assist him to to uh, rejoin his 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 group? And with that, we watched the village hide him in the bush and feed him and uh, make arrangements to move him from from. Basically, it turned out to be a, a count the soul, Hamlet's souls that was all prearranged. Um, but he made the excuse that he had to collect his kit and he came back to me. So straight away, we had actually, we had pristine intelligence. Um, the only time I'd ever heard of that. And I reported this back to, to my headquarters. But of course, the BSAP, who were sticklers for for procedures and uh, zero tolerance said you've carried out an illegal trap and there's a local missionary that's reported you to his office and so I, I came under investigation. So I was hauled out of the operational area, uh, sat in Wanky writing reports for two days and eventually it was troop change over time and I, we returned to our headquarters in Salisbury where the whole thing disappeared on a single um, 
memo and I was told not to do it again. The months passed um, and I ended up uh, in the uniform branch in um, Terezi and basically we were patrolling the gunnery zone so I still hadn't touched any police work, it all suited me. And I had an idea I wanted to go to the CID. So I went to the CID and somehow I got through my probation. I don't know how I did it, but I had just finished when fortunately I got a knock on my office door and the special branch guy walked in and he said, you've been invited to cross the road to special branch. So I said, well, thank goodness. I'll see a bit of action now, um, packed up and I crossed the road. Well, I didn't see any action because I was put straight into the, uh, the filing office to learn the uh, immense filing system of an uh, intelligence uh, office. And I was there for two weeks and then I was pulled out of there and they put me on to internal nationalism where I had to identify and tabulate all the, uh, the, uh, the souls, the tribal souls that would assist the, uh, the Zip terrorists on the incursions throughout Matabili land. And that took weeks. In fact, it took months and months, but it was immaculate reportage. Um, and each interview with each individual from the tribal area was much like a journalism, I suppose. Um, there was a lot of respect from both sides, from the, from the, uh, from the, uh, the, uh, the elders from the villages and things like that. And they were very straightforward. They had these souls and things like that. We identified a lot of these souls. Um, and as, uh, as time went by, a vacancy came up for Central Intelligence Organization. So I applied for it and I was approved and I thought I'd go straight to the Prime Minister's office. Um, it saved me writing uh, a promotion exams to Detective Inspector. So that was a big boost. But the day I left, McGuinness asked me to go and see him at Bindura. So I went, called in to see him and he said, look, um, come and work with us as a liaison intelligence officer for the Salu Scouts. Um, you'll have a nice job, you'll enjoy it, there's plenty of action, and we'll give you the Matabili Land uh, <coughs> Operation Tangent. They're building the new fort for the Scouts group that are moving down there, and that'll be your area. So I worked on Operation Cauldron, then I worked on Operation Repulse. And then I went to Operation Tangent, which was purely Zipra, but I was in my home element with old friends from the Special Branch office and the, uh, the facilities, the intelligence facilities that I had there was just, just amazing. And, you know, two particular, or well, maybe three particular operations that come to mind. Their source uh, acquisition of intelligence from sources, they had two particularly good sources that, that were codenamed Zulu uh, Z3 and Z7. One was a postal intercept um, where I'd done it myself, where we used to go into the post office and remove the suspicious uh, mail um, and uh, copy the letters and the mail would be back in the mailbag before the post office knew what was going on. And this was every 24 hours. So we had a finger on the pulse very much there. Um, Z7 was the telephone intercepts. This was pretty high tech because it was intercepts through to Lusaka, uh, uh, Zopi headquarters, Zip headquarters, and through to uh, Francis Town, which was a, a staging office for the Zipra. So the first uh, operation we went on, I wanted to authenticate a Zipra um, call sign. Now, when you see a Salu Scouts, uh, pseudo group getting ready to deploy. You're probably looking at 60 men broken into their sections. If you saw them out in the bush, you would engage them as terrorists. They were identical, their manner, their demeanor, everything they did was terrorists. They lived, ate and slept as terrorists. Although they were regular soldiers inter interspersed with captured Zipper, Zipper Ozonla <coughs> terrorists who had been turned. They were called tame terrorists. They, they'd actually changed sides. So to authenticate my first uh, group, I had acquired a letter from Special Branch Bulawayo, which had been a, Z, a, Z, a Z3 intercept. And in this letter, the, uh, the author, who was a senior nationalist in the Kwanda area, had requested uh, Zipra fighters 
to clear the area of Zonla, who were encroaching into the um, Wanda area. Now, they were, they were allies. They fell under the patriotic front, but whenever they met, they were like tomcats. They had attacked each other on site. So <clears throat> my call signs went into the Gwanda area in possession of the letter. They located the, uh, the author of the letter, and they said, we've arrived. Are you, where are these Zonla guys? And sure enough, the next morning at first light, he indicated the, uh, the Zonla base camp to them. That was such pristine intelligence. It, it, it was fantastic. The group then, we didn't have the fire force available, so the group themselves attacked the, which to authenticate themselves, attacked the uh, Zonla base camp, killing a few and capturing a couple of the Zonla guys. We were then able to use the Zonla guys in the Zonla uh, pseudo operation to say their cover story was that they had escaped, met up with a couple of other guys and they needed to get to detachments further on. So that gave us the, the Zonla sort of set, set up. Um, but we now had the key to Zonla in the Matibila land area. Unfortunately, things did not pan out that way. And I don't really want to go into why it didn't actually happen. Let's just say there's probably a conflict up in the top or someone decided they didn't want these operations to go ahead. So we continued on the uh, smaller, um, smaller pseudo stuff, picking up uh, odd groups here and there, but nothing big, nothing that was going to affect the outcome of the war. Now, the next one was, uh, there was a Z7 intercept on a call from Lusaka to Francis Town. And a guy by the name of Elliot and Logu whose alias was Black Swine, was a very senior member within the Zipra um, military. And he was traveling, or he had traveled from Lusaka to Francistown, driving in a white Land Rover. There used to be a dirt road, it's tar now, but it was a dirt road running down the Botswana border. So we knew that he would be returning to Lusaka. And so Lou Scouts, with that intelligence, uh, deployed and they set up an ambush uh, somewhere up towards the uh, the junction of the uh, Botswana and the Zimbabwe border and they set up an ambush with a, a command detonated uh, mine and an early warning system uh, which gave them this Elliot and Zorba as he was driving along and he had his uh, front wheel blown off he tried to make a run for it but he got a, a wounding shot through his um, through his side and he was recovered alive without a serious wound. Um, on his debrief, it was so valuable that operations like Green Leader, the CGT um, and Westlands Farm uh, went ahead, plus uh, probably even to the operation to take out Joshua and Como. A lot of that was on his debrief. So that was the value of um, the Z7. This was, this was the value of having a close liaison with your, your special branch uh, headquarters stations and the Sulu scouts. A lot of it was probably never witnessed by the military side. You know, they, they expected the intelligence and we had to, to supply it. So, you know, to have that liaison capability was just, uh, just fantastic. The, uh, the third operation was uh, also a Z7 operation from Lusaka to, um, to Francistown. And in that, um, Zipra headquarters said they had had complaints through uh, probably diplomatic services to say that the, uh, the Zaku chaps in Francistown were up to no good. They were attacking the females, robbing people, and just making a nuisance of themselves. The problem was that the police in Botswana were scared of them. And it said to the Zipra guys, they were going to get the Botswana Defense Force to deal with them. And of course, the uh, Zopi guys just laughed about it and they carried on with their, their misbehavior. So we had the queue. Um, and Koma Barracks then developed or created the Botswana Defense Force vehicles. And uh, we made up the uniforms for the Defense Force and a convoy of De uh, Botswana Defense Force, who was the Lou Scouts, entered in Botswana through a, a back road, and drove all the way through to France's town with a snatch team disguised as the Botswana Defense Force. When they arrived at the uh, uh, Zabu head office in Francistown, 
it was a security fence around it, locked gate, and the um, our Burgess, uh, Botswana Defence Force guy, leapt out of uh, his BDF vehicle and said, "We've had enough of you guys. Open up here. We come in to arrest the ringleaders." And of course, the Zaka guys opened up the gate and they went in. They snatched every single person inside the office and every single file, every cabinet, and everything like that. Put those in the vehicles and then drove out. Unfortunately, the real BDF had got wind of it, and uh, there was an oversight to secure the entry point into Botswana, and that's where there was the ambush, and we lost a very good uh, corporal there. But a lot of BDF guys were sort of put in the ground at, at, you know, from, from initiating that ambush. So that was the sort of aspect of the shooter from a special branch point of view. Um, that the Seleuze Scouts, that was such an essential um, uh, element to the Seleuze Scouts operations. There was one, there was one other, sorry, there was a fourth operation that, that I had to do, and it was on a similar type, uh, it was a Z3 or a Z7 intercept, but we needed to snatch a, one of the, uh, he was a dispatching commander in Zambia. So he would receive uh, groups coming in from wherever they'd been training, and he would arrange for them to come into Rhodesia, you know, rubber duckies across the Zambezi and things like that. A guy by the name of Bob Dongo. But it was necessary to go into Zambia as a, a Zambian army, just a Zambian army, and set up a checkpoint. And as his vehicle came through to snatch him in his uh, Land Rover, which all went ahead. The guys <clears throat> were taken across the river. Now we'd rehearsed this, but I did the inspection on these guys. And the one thing I overlooked was their hair. Be the, uh, Zambian army had very short hair, similar to British and African rifles. It was short, you know, um, short back and sides. And I'd overlooked that. And these guys being to do scouts, they liked their R&R. &R, and so they liked to have their hair a little bit long. But as they set up their checkpoint, this Vandover came in and Bob Dongo said, those are not uh, Zambian army, we're being set up here. And he tried to make a run for it. Unfortunately, Bob had to get shot and wounded and uh, he was brought back, but sadly, Bob, uh, Bob passed away. Um, that was the end of Bob. So it was just, you know, from my side, it was not attention to detail. If we'd had attention to detail, um, Bob might still have been alive today, you know, to, to tell us a story. So, uh, yes, that was, uh, that was all the interesting part of uh, Scouts. Again, um, I know there are lots of different answers or theories. Nobody really seems to be able to put their finger on it. But there appears to have been some sort of a leak that thwarted the attempt to kill Joshua and Kana in Lusaka. Have you any idea what might have gone wrong there, but it appears he was forewarned. Well, you know, there was, there was, there was quite a few people privy to uh, top secret uh, information like that. Now, I, I wasn't privy to that, that, that was a special, uh, the SAS operation that, uh, that went ahead there. Um, I, I had no idea on what was going on, but uh, it could only have been very senior people involved in that people privy to special forces operations so you know you could work out on that you could it would come from somewhere in, up at the top of um, central intelligence i don't think it was ken flower he had a 2ic um his name sort of escapes me at the moment um his big friend was um mac mcginnis who ran the scouts um and then there was other people in com, com ops themselves, uh, decision makers, who all would have been privy to that information. Probably about half a dozen of them. Look, I don't think I don't think Britain intelligence was destroying our operations. It it wouldn't make sense. Why would MI6 destroy a source by compromising operation? They would receive the information, but they wouldn't compromise the operation. So it would have to be someone else other than the Brits. Everybody blames the British, but it, to me, it, it wasn't the British. It could have been the South Africans. My, my biggest suspicion is that it was South African uh, involvement. Whoever was working for the South Africans, I would say that was it. I, th I think the operations against Mugabe was probably direct. I think Mugabe had recruited someone very close within 
Central Intelligence and uh, was receiving direct intelligence from that level. Those are just my suspicions there. Ken, looking back um, from an intelligence point of view, um, what do you think, where do you think we could have done better, put it that way? What would you have done better or differently? Well, I think we should have, uh, talking very sort of largely here, I think the British Light Infantry should have been increased to three battalions to increase the fire force uh, capability. Um, and I think we should have uh, concentrated purely on external operations. I think if we had destroyed every Zonla camp externally, that war would have finished very soon. Yeah, I think uh, I, I'm inclined to agree with you, but we've got to remember there was, um, there was a, resources were always a problem. And uh, the South Africans always had a gun at Ian Smith's head. And uh, yes. they, they, they weren't happy with um, too aggressive a posture. So, uh, well, I, think, I, 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 you know, I always <clears throat> wondered, and I often queried, you know, when are we going to attack externally? And I would always get an answer, it's not politically viable to attack. And then I heard a later story was the, the South Africans were only, <laughs> only interested when we were going to take out the Mozambique uh, railway infrastructure but not to destroy it, just to damage it severely because the ministers had their fingers in the pies and they would rush in and do the whole maintenance. We get those huge uh, uh, locomotive workshop uh, contracts and uh, make their fortune. So I think with the South African uh, Bruder Bond set up in the government, they were running it on, on a, on a money-making racket and they just saw us as, as an opportunity to make money. And of course we had no choice, we had to rely on them. Otherwise we, we would have, as you say, the gun against our head, we would have had no fuel and we would have had no ammunition. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that was a, that was a very uh, big inhibiting factor. Um, Ken, just um, tell us about where you are now, um, what you're doing. Well, you were in Afghanistan for a while, you were in, in Iraq. Um, I'm, no, I'm back, I'm in South Africa. Um, we're looking at a new venture about 18 months ago, a big international um, security group uh, wanted to uh, go into Mozambique, um, into the Cabo Delgado area where you have the ISIS uh, incursion. And their idea was um, to put in a super group um, as consultants to take over the security of the massive um, gas exploration fields that are taking place with the, uh, the huge international companies. So we, we assembled a group uh, of all special forces guys with special um, skills, uh, everything that would be needed in any African war. But the contract didn't come through, so we maintained the, uh, the group. And at, at the moment, we are looking very much to, uh, to gain into Mozambique. Uh, we have a solution that we can offer to a total. Um, to give them security for longevity on their multi-billion dollar project there. Um, so yeah, I can't really say too much about it, but um, that that is what we're working very seriously on at the moment. And you've got the personnel to sort of tick all the boxes. Yes, we've got, we've got uh, special forces guys. We've got very experienced um, combat pilots, uh, recon pilots, um, high-tech guys and things like that, because wars have changed now. Everybody's working on uh, high-tech um, satellite, real-time imaging and things like that, yes. Ken, um, I, I know you're pretty up on what's going on up there and uh, what's your reading of the current situation? Well, you know, one only has to look at the month SITREP for, for November, and it's got the highest civilian casualty rate um, that it's ever had. So to me, that's a barometer of uh, how things are going horribly wrong and the way they are pursuing it. They need to, uh, they need to have an airborne assault unit. Um, we need to get in and train an airborne assault uh, unit, not to do the fighting, just as a consultant. Um, to train the airborne assault guys, train their instructors, train their pilots, train their technicians, 
um, train the whole duty so they can actually run an operation from the joint operational control between their own military and their own police. Um, and we can do that. We can pass out a company of uh, airborne troops every, uh, every 10 weeks. As long as they get through the selection and then they do the 10 week training, we will do that. We're going to use some Bobby instructors, special forces instructors uh, to do all that. We've, we've got the whole puzzle. We've put it through. It is liked by quite a few of the people, but it's a case of they're all waiting to see which way it's going to go. But it's going hopelessly the wrong way. Put it this way, the tsunami is already in and what they have there are already out of their depth. So it needs a, a, a new strategy now to come in and begin. And it can and still be turned around. The million dollar question, who's, who's, who's behind this, do you think? I mean, I know a lot of it has has sort of its origins in organized crime, but it's morphed into something now uh, very effective. Um, well, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely um, Islamic terror uh, sponsorship. They have just jumped on the bandwagon. Opium comes in from, and has been coming in from uh, Afghan, Afghanistan via Pakistan for years. And uh, fishermen would go out 60, to 100 kilometers out to collect this uh, contraband off the ships. And that would be moved ashore. And from uh, onshore, uh, various Asian traders within uh, Mozambique and probably the senior for Lima people would then arrange for this uh, opium uh, to be moved by road through to Johannesburg Free Trade Zone at uh, Oatambo Airport. And from there, it finds its way further onto Europe and, uh, and the UK. And I think it's something like they are probably getting something like 500 million US dollars a year from that trade that's, uh, that's coming in. It's also increased with the, um, the US and the French uh, anti-piracy coverage of Tanzania and Somalia. So it's moved further down the coast. Whether it'll come into South Africa, I doubt it. I think they need that, um, that medium of, uh, of uh, Muslim... Um, High density populated areas um, to be able to operate, and Cabo Delgado is the uh, it's the uh, high population area of the um, Sufi uh, Muslims, and of course you've got Malawi uh, Lake right next door, which are also the same uh, Muslims. Those are the peaceful guys; they are not the Wahhabis uh, who all your Islamic terrorists are, apart from the Taliban, but. Uh, it could spread there and uh, link up with the DRC uh, from eastern uh, Uganda. That's a serious sort of uh, effort, yeah. Well, it sounds like a, it's, it, it's a very pressing problem requiring uh, some urgent intervention. And it doesn't look like there's, a, there's an awful lot uh, going on. A lot of people looking on, um, shaking their heads. Yes, that's exactly what it is. A lot of people just looking on and putting out positive situation reports every month. Uh, and they uh, they live to earn the US dollars uh, for another month, yeah. Well, Kim, thanks very, very much for your time. And what I forgot to mention um, at the beginning was that you had helped me enormously with my latest book, Men of War. Um, thanks to you, I was able to include some of um, your operations and your recollections of the peace and special branch role in the war. Um, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, so thank you, thank That's you for that. Time, yeah. And um, thanks very much for your time. And um, you asked, you, you did ask me one question that I consider myself a, a, a Seleucid so special branch. Uh, well, I definitely, I'm a British South Africa police uh, special branch operative. I was never a Sulu scout. I never did their selection. Um, I did their training course uh, for two weeks. I enjoyed that. I probably could have done selection. I found that I was fitter than quite a few of the guys. But definitely my, my colors are British South Africa police uh, special branch. With formative years and support unit, yeah. A great police force and uh, something to be enormously proud of, I would say. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Ken. Thank, Thank you, Alice.
چیز کنید